Thank you. Yes, Mr. Dimas. Thank you, my lord. Um, I did and my head up to the court yesterday, my lord. Um, I've substituted it. There was one or two spelling mistakes. And I've also added an index to it, my lord. So it's the same S, but just with a few small alterations as to spelling mistakes, etc., my lord. Um, yes. My lord, um, after the finding in the first in which there was major disquiet. And I must start like I start with my opening address, my Lord. I must refer ironically uh, to the very quote from the decided case of Timor versus the magistrate of Johannesburg. Nevertheless, the inquest must be so thorough that the public and the interested parties are satisfied that there has been a full and a fair investigation into the circumstances of the death. My Lord, now we can say the Audi Altrem Fartim rule has been complied with. We have given the detainees a voice, my Lord. So both sides have been heard now. You've got the benefit now of more than a thousand extra pages. So while you rely on the old inquest, you've got an extra new evidence that you can rely and that we can say that it was a full and a fair investigation, my Lord. My Lord, this is a reopened inquest in terms of Section 70A, it's unique. In other words, after the determination of the original inquest, it was deemed necessary and in the interest of justice that a judge of the Supreme Court should reopen this inquest. And I want to emphasize the word, in the interest of justice. This is what it's all about. It's to set the record straight, my Lord. It's the interest of justice. It's not an appeal or it's not a review. It's in the interest of justice, my Lord. Such a reopened inquest should, as far as possible, my Lord, be continued and disposed of on the existing record of the proceedings. And Section 72 of the Act also applies. As to this Court's powers, the prosecu prosecution will address you a little bit later on in regard to the findings that you will make, my Lord. But in general, we've taken further evidence as the Act prescribed. To a certain extent, the original record is still very important, my Lord. Uh, you've got to have the original record, and for instance, if you take the post-mortem, we've got very good evidence of the two forensic pathologists now, but they rely on the original inquest, my Lord, and that's just as the Act prescribed. There can be no question, my Lord, that the voice of the Tainis were not heard before in this closed circum closed circuit and this closed system that we had, my Lord, like Professor Don Foster described it. So it was in the interest of justice that everybody should be heard. But you've also got the benefit now of the forensic pathologists, Dr. Holland and Dr. Naidu, that analyzed the original inquest, my Lord, and they are of appreciable help. And similarly, we've got the aeronautical engineer now, Mr. Moodley, that can help you a lot. And that's important, my Lord, and I want to quote from the, from the original inquest because it, it's, it's so interesting. Brigadier Patel, testifying on the seventh day of the original inquest, <clears throat> he answered some of the questions from the presiding magistrate, Mr. J.J. Aldevillius. He said the following, my Lord, had Sergeant Rodriguez pushed the deceased dead or alive from the window, the body would have fallen perpendicular and landed in a cement moat much closer to the wall. He testified that he measured that Mr. Timul had hit the ground three meters away from the building. The body <coughs> being where it was indicated to me that a certain amount of propulsion had propelled Mr. Timul away from the building. He told the court that from the 10th floor there was a sheer drop with no projections which the body would have struck on the way down, causing it to be propelled forward. Uh, Mr. Isi Meisel's Queen Council, QC, my Lord, for the Timor family, asked Brigadier Patel if he had done any exper experiments regarding falling objects. So Brigadier Patel answered, 
No, sir. I've left that to Isaac Newton. I only know what I have read. Now, my Lord, that's actually more tragic than it's comic. That's exactly the reason why we had to reopen this, uh, this inquest, why we needed the expertise of a Mr. Moodley, of an aeronautical engineer. It's very easy for the layman to misunderstand the trajectory of a body. And that's exactly why it was in the interest of justice. And that's why I took that quote, my Lord. So on the one hand, you've got to rely on the original inquest. But on the other hand, my Lord, you've got to analyze that inquest very meticulously to see if the interest of justice, you shouldn't change some findings. strange that only the evidence relating to the police should disappear. Now, I'm unable to make an assessment as to what their performance was, was in court because of the disappearance of those. How do I deal with that situation? It, it is quite a shortcoming that we do have, my Lord, but to a big extent, we still have the affidavits. All the affidavits is available. And I must say, the original inquest court did sum up all the police's evidence. Yes. So we've got a complete summing up of the evidence in the original inquest, my Lord. There's one or two things in cross-examination, obviously that's not there. Yes. Uh, but for the most important one, we also had Mr. Rodriguez here, so you could observe Mr. Rodriguez while giving that. So uh, the crucial witnesses, my Lord, is, is still very important. And if you take Brigadier Patel, for instance, even the inquest court finds that, that, that Patel um, he did not collude with General Base, etc. So he found yes. him to be a very, very credible witness. And to his big extent, um, it's Brigadier Patel that brings out the biggest contradictions with um, Rodriguez's evidence. It's him that has taken that photograph and insisted that Peter van der Merwe, the photographer, come back that very same night. So, yes, my lord, there's shortcomings, but I still say we've got the affidavits and we've got a total summing up of the evidence in the judgment of the first magistrate. Yeah. And I don't think that, that that's too big a shortcoming, my lord. Yeah. Thank you, my lord. If I can do a summary of the submissions to the court, why I think it's the interest of justice and why your findings should differ from the original filing. In accordance with section 17A, 3B of the inquest act, it stated that you, my lord, shall record any finding that differs from the finding referred to in section 16.2, as well as in the respect in which it differs. And my Lord, there's a few themes. I know you've got to answer just four questions, and I think just two of them is in contention, the others uh, as to the identity and the date on which Mr. Timmel died, there can be, it, it would be common cause, it's just the other two. But there are certain themes that, that I think that you should need addressed. Um, in, in the original inquest, my lord, there was a main finding that there was no assault on Mr. Ahmed Timo. And my respectful submission to you is that is wrong. That should be changed. It is said that he is not angerant nie en geen rede om al die getuienis te verwerp nie dat Timo op a beskaafde en a menselike wijze behandel is. That, my lord, is wrong. And in the interest of justice, it must be rectified. There was a finding that there was no torture, my lord. And closely related to that was whether Ahmed Timo was involved in a brawl. Ma now, firstly, my Lord, we've got the evidence of Dr. Salim Aesop here that vividly described how he was brutalized. And as been said quite often in this court, um, if that happened to him, what would have happened to the bigger fish in this? We've got the evidence of Dr. Dilshad Jekta. And... Dr. Knight so poignantly saying about Van Tonder that was kind to him and he only remembered that kindness, my lord. Now all this confer confirms assaults and torture on the detainees, my lord. There can be no question that they were ass assaulted. Significantly, the, uh, the police witnesses only dealt with assault. They denied that there was any assault or any assault that they witnessed. But they didn't touch the broader subject of torture. In fact, uh, else, 
who testified conceded that uh, by making a detainee stand the whole night being under interrogation, that is a technique that they apply, which is a form of torture. It may not be an assault that results in a physical harm that we see, but it's a form of torture. And uh, one has to look at those, including electrocution, which obviously the doctors may not have been able to pick up from the body. But then uh, one has to look at the concept of torture broadly and not confine it to assaults only. And I want you to, to deal with that, to comment on that. Yes. That the evidence as it stands now, does it allow me to make a finding that one, all the detainees were tortured, and two, that some, if not all of them, were assaulted, and three, that the interrogators are the people who are responsible for them? With respect, quite, my Lord, it's just like the, the, this court has put it. If we take the evidence of Professor Don Foster, and he described it quite well, that it's not just physical assault that should be taken into account, but it's psychological also, yeah. uh, being arrested. He describes the background and the scientific approach to torture quite well, my lord, if you take his evidence. Yeah. And, and quite rightly, and I've put it in my head, that we, we got unexpected assistance in regard to this point of torture from else. He said, yes, it was acceptable. You try to break the man as quickly as possible with sleep deprivation, it's acceptable. And that in itself, my lord, is torture. So this court can make that finding yes. in regard to that, my lord. Okay. Also very interesting, Dr. Dilsrat Jetum, that said, well, they immediately took, took away a, a watch. Yes. So to disorientate it. And yes. very interesting, you also is uh, Professor Knight, how they did the, the, the specific torture that would leave no marks if they, they used cloth to put that and hang you on the, the broomstick, my lord. Uh, and, and it doesn't leave any specific marks, just your hands uh, is, is the one. And there can be no question that he was tortured in that fashion. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we get it in his file. Mm -hmm. uh, physiotherapists came to see him for three weeks after. So there can be no question that he yeah. was tortured in, the, in, in that regard. And also very interesting, my Lord, it's not just the, the question of torture for Dr. Salim Insel. It's also how hanging, hanging him over the stairs, my Lord. Yes. And then how to cover it up. If we look at uh, Pro Professor Knight's evidence specifically, all of them said, yes, they s he stood like that. So the cover-up was quite clear in that one, my Lord. How they covered it up to say, well, everywhere, he, whether he sit or stand, he stood like this. So you couldn't see his hands, my Lord. So everybody in their statements covered up like that. So yes. it's a number of, of matters that you've got to take into consideration. And yes... We also get the evidence of Elsa that helps us about torture, my lord. Um, if we combine it, all the strands then is pulled together by Don Foster, where he did his scientific research and said on a systematic basis. <laughs> it's quite interesting, my lord. He has done this research 35 years ago, and it related to the 70s and to the 80s. And he pulled all that strands together of the similar facts, my lord. Yes. And then we add all the Erasmus evidence. So if we got the medical evidence, the evidence of the detainees themselves, all the Erasmus, Don Foster, the totality of evidence, my respectful submission to this court is that you can make the finding of torture, firstly, my lord. And secondly, if you take the injuries on the body of Ahmetimo, you can make a finding of assault on Ahmetimo, my lord. So I say that's the starting point. The first finding that differs from that court would be he was assaulted. Ahmed Timo was assaulted, my lord, on the totality of evidence. So, in other words, from the missing documentation, there wouldn't be any evidence that shows that he was injured in a brawl somewhere, uh, because that's what the magistrate found. He, he attributed the injuries as, as having been sustained in a brawl before his arrest. Exactly, my lord, and that's why the evidence of a person like Dr. Salim Esop was so important to say yeah. this is the kind of person that Ahmed Timo was. He was a kind of type of person that didn't go around and got involved in, in brawls. My Lord, on the probabilities you can find that you would not have become involved in a brawl. And we've got direct evidence to that, my Lord, also on the affidavits. People that have seen Ahmed Timo on that Friday afternoon, 
And even Dr. Salim Esok can say there was no injuries on him. And lo and behold, uh, it's a, a double-edged sword also, my Lord. All the witnesses from the police said, well, we didn't see that he was assaulted. But at the same time, and I'll quote it to you, in my, it's in my head also. They also had to say, but we also didn't see any injuries on him. So it's a double-edged sword, that one, and I'll, I'll quote that to you. So, my Lord, the first point I want to make is, and the first theme, is you can make a different finding in regard to assault and torture on Ahmed The second big theme and that I want to address to you is a question relating to suicide. And closely related to that theme, my Lord, is a reason for suicide. Now, what I want to state there, firstly, I want to say there can be no question that this court can find that the last part of Inkululeku 2 is a falsification, and a crude one at that. You can find that, my Lord. Ronnie Castle's evidence proved that, that that last little part is a total falsification, my Lord. But you can combine that evidence of him with Esau Pahad's evidence, Stephanie Kent, but also Paul Erasmus that talked about Stratcom and how they falsified things, my Lord. If you take the totality of the evidence, you can find that, that reason that they wanted to present to the court about the policy of the Communist Party. You can find that that is a falsification, my Lord. Secondly, in regard to the same theme of suicide, my Lord, I respectfully submit that this court can find that the shock on the face of Ahmed Tibor when the name Quentin Jacobson, Henry and Martin was mentioned and that they were identified you can also reject that version, my lord. Before we get to that version, still on this publication of Inkululego 2, towards the end it says issued by the Communist Party of South Africa. And we know that at that time that organization had been dissolved. It had been banned, in fact, and faced in terms of Section 50 of the Suppression of Communism Act. And thereafter, it was, it was dissolved. And at the time of this particular publication, there was in existence the South African Communist Party, and not Communist Party of South Africa. Could the magistrate have seen that difference? I'm not sure whether the magistrate would, would have picked that up if, if there was not evidence to that effect, my lord. I'm not sure whether everybody would have been au okay with the smaller details the nuances yes. that, that, that people that, uh, that are well acquainted with it would know. I don't know whether you should see it, but now it's quite obvious that it's a big, yes. it's like uh, Afrikaner like me trying to, to, to make the language mistakes that we find in that last part, my Lord. It's, but it's then the obvious, the other obvious glaring problem with that document is that it is dated February 1972, about four or five months after Timor had passed on. If it was produced in February 1972, how could the magistrate not have seen that, that this document is dated February 19, 1972, and Mr. Timor died in 1971, and therefore how could it have been a reason for him to commit? I, I, I just couldn't understand the reasoning there. It's quite right, my lord. Once again, the, the, this court hits the nail on the, on the head there, my lord. That's quite, quite right there. Um, Maybe we, we can find a reason, if we've got to find a reason for that, is because only a small part of that publication was quoted to the court. It is not, wasn't necessarily handed in. That, and that just part was quoted about suicide, was quoted to him, um, and then that's possibly the reason. And it was only in the new agate that it, it, it was used, my lord. So I'm not sure that the whole document was handed in. In, in yes, yes, Mr. Bezos said that, that to his yeah. recollection it wasn't handed in in the evidence, but he said, I came to be in possession of it. In his judgment, he, the message says, I came to be in possession of it. How he doesn't explain, from whom he doesn't explain. And these are some of the, the problems that I have with his conclusion on that document. But I take note of what you're saying, so you may proceed right. with the Thank other. Thank you, my Lord. So I say this court with big confidence can find that that is a total falsification, my Lord. The second one of this theme of suicide is that all of a sudden, all three of the gentlemen in that room could see shock 
on the face of Ahmed Timo when Quentin Jacobson, um, Martin and Henry's name was mentioned. That you can also reject, my Lord, as a cover-up and as a sham. The evidence of Advocate George Bezos, as well as Salim Esop and a number of other witnesses, proved directly that there was no political link between Quentin Jacobson and Ahmed Timo. Um, my Lord, so there was no reason that there should be a shock. I'm not even talking about the improbability of seeing this, the shock from the, from the top there. But once again, it's like the folding arms cover up, my Lord, where all three of them say the same thing and say, look shocked when, when, when that happened. And this is also where Paul Erasmus's evidence come in. Obviously, he would have been questioned about Quentin, Martin, and Andrew to see if they were politically involved. And like Stratcom, they've got to base it on something realistic. So that's the reason what that, why they would bring in that common name. But I'm submitting to this court that you can find that that's another cover-up by the police. All three mention it in their statements, my lord, and it's a cover-up. And the further one about suicide also is, once again, all three of them mention, according to their opinion, the long term of imprisonment would have been another motive why he committed suicide. Now, firstly, that is inadmissible opinion evidence of a policeman. If I have called Don Foster or Diane Chandler or a psychologist, then they can venture opinion like that. But once again, the long-term imprisonment would not have been a motive, my lord. The bottom line is that you can reject the finding relating to suicide. That's the submission that I make to this court, my lord. So, and and and. My learned junior also said that the, the evidence of Esopard was very important here as to the cultural taboo of, of this, this type of thing, my Lord. So, in regard to, to suicide, this court can make a finding that the well-prepared type version of the security police, including the opinion about the long-term um, imprisonment and the shock about Quentin Jacobson, you can reject that version, my Lord, and say that this was a cover-up and that it was not suicide. My Lord, I also show in my heads that there are a myriad of unsatisfactory aspects in the evidence of Rodriguez. There are serious contradictions in his version, as well as major improbabilities. Um, some of the major contradictions were noted by the original inquest. Wiesen Lecke Verskiller, it was, was said there, a spelling mistake also in regard to that. But the original inquest court found that to just show that there was no collusion between Patel and General Bayes. My Lord, with respect, that's not the correct approach. We must still explain the big contradictions. It's good to tell me, well, um, the fact that Patel knew that his evidence is going to be different from Bayes showed that there was no collusion doesn't explain why Rodriguez is telling five different stories about what happened in that room, my lord. So, with respect, the original inquest court did not address the material discrepancies and the major improbabilities in that version. And, and in that regard, your findings should also be, be different. Uh, my lord, in a closed system, like Professor Don Foster would have described it, by and large, all the decisions in the original inquest was in favor of the security police. The conversation, for instance, by Ava Timor, where she talked about the Pax law and that they shouldn't give Timor a Pax law, that had a ring of truth to it, and she was corroborated by her husband. In the interest of justice, those type of findings should be corrected by this court, my lord. So to summarize the main themes that I want to address to this court, first and foremost, the finding that there was no assaults and no torture. That is wrong, my Lord. The combined effect of all the detainees' evidence with the medical evidence, with the evidence of Professor Foster and Paul Erasmus, Elsa's evidence, as well as the file of Fanny Cat, my Lord, on the totality of the evidence, you can find that there would have been assault and there was torture. Secondly, the finding about suicide is wrong, my Lord. You can find that the last part of Inkululeku 2 is a falsification. The evidence of Ronnie Castles, Paul Erasmus, and all the other members like Dr. Salim Esopart and Stephanie Kemp, that is proof of that, my Lord. 
There was a cover-up by the police to say there was a shocked expression on his face about Quinton Martin and Henry, my lord. You can also reject that. And if we move from there, then we'll get to your findings in the end. My lord, if you look at my index to my edge, you'll see um, from page 7, there's an analysis of all the detainees' evidence. Yeah. Dr. Evid uh, Aesop's evidence is discussed there from 7 to 13, Professor Knight. Um, I might just make an addition to Dr. Aesop's evidence that he's also important in regard that there was no political link between Quentin Jacobson and Ahmed Timo, my lord. That's just possibly the one. But all the evidence is discussed there. Also, the relevant case law is set out by my learned junior uh, quite brilliantly, my lord. And then we also find the analysis of the medical evidence in the original inquest that I'm not going to read through all that and yeah. uh, repeat what you heard, my lord. Um, maybe if I could jump to the basic version by the security police, and if I can concentrate possibly on the analysis of the Rodriguez version, and that's more or less on page 67 of my age, my lord. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go into the version of the security police in general about um, the shock on their face. I've just addressed that matter to this court, um, my lord, that that is a sham and a cover up, a falsification to get a reason why he allegedly committed suicide. Um, maybe before I just start with uh, the Rodriguez version, I can take the preconceived conclusion by the independent, independent police investigation there on my page. From the beginning, I state there, my head's Lord, the preconceived conclusion was made that no foul play was suspected in this regard. If you compare the tight investigation diary, my Lord, you'll find it very early on that it stated there, does geen rede om enige gemeenspel te vermoed nie. Um, even in the report, we get that very early on that one uh, newspaper clipping that said um, there's no gemeen spell, no foul play. My Lord, that approach with respect is not the correct one that you can make so early during that. Um, as to Rodriguez's version, a major proportion of what happened in room 1026 is provided by Jao Rodriguez. And basically the version of the security police in this regard is that Ahmed Timur was being questioned again by Captains Gloy and Van Niekerk on Wednesday the 27th of October. At more or less 3.30 that afternoon, Rodriguez arrived with salary checks and an envelope with a document in it, my lord. He also brought in three cups of coffee, according to him. Now, he just stood there at the end of the table and he did not take part in the interrogation. A mysterious person, Mr. X, entered and mentioned that the person, Quentin Jacobson, Martin and Henry, uh, were apparently identified or arrested, as to, according to his version. And then this was according to all three policemen in the room that gave rise to shock on the face of the detainee. Captains Gloy and Fenikart left the room to discuss the matter on the ninth floor, and Gloy asked Rodriguez to look after the detainee. The detainee asked to go to the toilet, and uh, when Rodriguez was sitting at chair A, where Captain Gloy was sitting previously, uh, the detainee moved, bolted around the table, or rather stormed around the table, and he left through the window. Exactly how is not stated. Now, my lord, there are a number of unsatisfactory aspects to this version, as well as major improbabilities and contradictions. If I can just quickly run through them, my lord. Mm -hmm. Whereas his real name is Joao Anastasio Rodriguez, he gives evidence under the name of Juan. And I quote there, um, your clerk asks him, he follow now in fun as a belief, witness Jan Rodriguez. He's confronted with this on page 685, line 10 to 20. So your real name is Joao Anastasio. So my actual name is Joao Anastasio. Um, I put it to him, you did not try to get away from the past, did you? He did not understand it from my past. He said, yeah, I do not understand the question. But then, my Lord, in the end, when you questioned him about the commendation by the commissioner of police that has written the letter for him and that he was not even interested about it, 
He once again said, It's each one to lead something of the past, my Lord. He also viewed the country as being in a war situation and he wanted to get trained from the very experienced persons who were at the border. I get in here terug gaan, dit was nou na die politie toe, that I said in brackets, want ons was in een oorlogssituasie en ek wou die opleiding kursus waar die politie aangebied het vir die manne wat grens toe gaan wou ek deur gaan. Dit was net een tydelike story vir my. Ek het toe die opleiding gekregen en is terug na die werk toe waar ek was. Um, in cross-examination he was confronted with this. My Lord, obviously he has been less than honest when he wanted to re-enroll in the police in this case. The approach of this witness that he only heard about torture in the security police, but he has never seen it. The court also asked him about this approach, my, my Lord. And then if you go through his file, you'll find a number of references that he is a sub redacteur. Uh, I quote them, um, my Lord, um, all the references in his file mm -hmm. relating, relating to him being a, uh, a sub redacteur, and I'll just read the last sentence. Tot in hierdie oedanigheid as sub redacteur is het recht. Yet, when I asked him, then he was in the data redacteur, a sub redacteur by Hoogstad, he said, nee, nee. He was asked specifically, evidence in chief, whether he had undergone specialized training, my Lord, and his emphatic answer was no. I quote his evidence. Did you do any other specialized co police courses during your service? Geen. He states later that he geen by komende kursus geloop het in die politie nie. Uh, it's <laughs> later on it's quite shown that he did this teen insurgency, this counterinsurgency training and once again if we look into his file it's stated there under the heading Kursus in 1976 <coughs> June 12 teen insurgency once again his evidence about this umbrella term for counterinsurgency um, is not satisfactory my lord he was asked about this and an umbrella term for this could it not perhaps be counted in insurgency training? I cannot say that. And then the court quite correctly asking, but you cannot dispute that either. His evidence now is that Quentin Jacobson was arrested, not identified. And once again, my Lord, I quote that. Then I come to the improvisation where he wasn't introduced to Ahmed Timol it was a big need to know principle that was there at the security police. He didn't know what Hans Gloy, Captain Gloy, and Van Nieker did. He was viewed as an outsider, and he just stood at the table. Yet, after Timo got out of the window, he knew to run out and to say, well, Timo, jump. My Lord, his evidence in this regard was also totally unsatisfactory. Um, all of a sudden, he was introduced to Timul now when he came in, and he made the addition that he was a valuable witness when he gave evidence about that. And there on page 72, you'll see, I quote, his totally unsatisfactory evidence that he gave around about this whole thing being introduced to Timul. And the other thing is, my Lord, you also know quite well what's the difference between spring and date. Why res gesta, you would have said, Timul het gespring, where his evidence is actually that he dived, is, is also not explained. Shortly put, my Lord, unsatisfactory evidence about um, Ahmed Timul there. Uh, the three cups of coffee, I'm not going to go through all this, my Lord. Um, on page 73, we'll get to the massive improbability that him being a sporting, a big man, sitting in front of the window, and yet this detainee that has been in detention from Friday, in all probability, for sure he did not sleep on the Friday night. There would have been sleep deprivation. There would have been assault. Yet this smallest bulk detainee gets around him without him touching that. My Lord, that's a very big improbability. I'm not going to go too long into that, but that's a very big improbability. And as the court asked him there, he came on the eastern side. He came on the left side of the table. He went to go and sit on, uh, on chair A. The court asked him, how would you have known that he wouldn't move that way? Once again, he couldn't answer that, my Lord, when you ask him in, in, in regard to that. So that's a massive improbability, my Lord. And um, his evidence that the photographer asked him to go and stand there and he's shown that out, it's, it's totally not the truth, my Lord. Um, 
I state here on page 74 that it's totally improbable from where he was standing that he could see shock on the face of Ahmed Timul. He did not know Ahmed Timul from a bar of soap. He did not take part in the questioning, etc. How he would have known that, that Timul looked shocked at that stage. Whereas later on he said, I, I drukken loos. Expressionless he looked there. My Lord, uh, there's a lot. There's serious fundamental contradi contradictions in his version, my Lord. Um, there are serious fundamental contradictions between his evidence and Gloy's evidence, between his evidence and Van Niekerk's evidence, between his evidence and General Bayes's evidence, and then the big one, between his evidence and General Pappel. There's at least four big, serious discrepancies there, my Lord. On the one time he goes left around the table, on the other time the person is running towards the door and he comes back, my Lord, uh, there's just no consistency in the version that he provides. I quote all that, that, that serious contradictions, my Lord, in regard to Gloy, in regard to Van Niekerk, you'll see that in page 76, the version of Bass. And it's only him that could have given that version to Bass. Nobody else could have given that one. And then the serious one with Brigadier Pattel. And there's no explanation for the one of Pattel, my Lord, because the photographer has taken pictures of him. And we've seen that specific picture where he stands to the left side of that table. And he can't explain why he's on that left side. That's the version that he's given to Pattel. So he wants to say that they did not make any notes, um, etc. They relied on the um, mind specifically to, to remember all this. Um, my Lord, really, his version as to why this, this big, big discrepancies with respect doesn't go up. On page 78, I get to his most recent version, the one that he provided with. Here he said, Ek het my balans verloor en ek het op die grond, het op die grond toe getuimel. Ek het my bo met my boelijf op die grond beland, op die vloer beland, en toe ek opsin, when I jumped up, I realized that Timo was not there anymore. In cross-examination, he once again said, I fell off my chair and fell on the ground. So you were on all fours. That is correct. That, my Lord, now is the fifth version about exactly what happens there. Once again, he stretched stretch out. My Lord, regarding this new addition to his evidence that the senior officers intimidated him and wanted to make an addition to his evidence about the wrestling with Ahmed Timol in there, with respect, that's, that's also a new addition. And quite rightly, the court asked him, but you've 27 years, why didn't you come forward with this earlier? So, so my Lord, once again, um, there's a lot of... of unsatisfactory aspects to it and big fundamental contradictions. I refer to the choice of words that he himself described this as an ac accident, whereas his senior officers want him to add stuff to make additions. Uh, he said, Darum et ek nie nie, so he withhold evidence. And, and I come to the point that something really terrible must have happened in that room and he does not want to play open cards with this court and he's fabricating, my Lord, you can reject his version. The long and short of it, my Lord, is you can reject his version as to what happened in that room. On his own merits. On his own merits, my Lord. But then if one has to go into the evidence of uh, Mr. Tokan, Mr. Adam, those who testified that the incident that they witnessed occurred in the morning, and uh, Rodriguez is adamant that it occurred in the afternoon. Now, I have to deal with it. Uh, if I accept the evidence that what they saw was in the morning, then it casts a shadow over what Rodriguez was saying. And if I have to reject the evidence of the two gentlemen, together with that of uh, the retired advocate, Matisse, who said he couldn't remember, but if we had to take a guess, it must have been in the morning because you are preparing for a case. Now, if I take, if I reject that evidence, what would be the grounds to do so? What would be the reason to do so? Yes, and yes, decide that it was in the afternoon. Yes, yes, my lord. Uh, if three witnesses, independent witnesses, come with that kind of thing, and to a big extent, it can show to what lengths that uh, the security police can go to cover up the tracks. The difficult one for me in that regard is um, 
the evidence of the ordinary police, like Brigadier Prattel and the photographer, would also come into the fore. But if that happened in the morning and they only disclose it to the other police in the afternoon, that would describe it. But then it was just a bigger cover-up. And Rodriguez was part of that cover-up. Yes. It's like the same where there was shock on the face about Quinton Jacobson. It just made the cover-up so much bigger. Yes, well, the, the other witnesses that came in in the afternoon would probably, they, di they, they did not indicate that they were there uh, throughout the day. If it happened in the morning, Brigadier Patel came late in the afternoon to take photographs. And uh, Dr. Kemp was called in around 4 o'clock. But now in declaring Timor dead, he did not put in the time of death. We just declared him dead at that time. You he see, could have I died just, earlier. Yeah. And, and which, is, which, is, which is one issue that I'm grappling with. Yeah, it, it, it's quite difficult to think that the photographer would also be part of such a big conspiracy um, yes. from my lord. But I mean, they needn't be part of the bigger conspiracy if, if they only tell it in the afternoon what happened, my lord. Yes. Um, yes, um, Dr. Kent just also said, I passed to it. It was always interesting to me when it was not an issue that the he put at the back of it, I, he recently died. I spasped to it. There was also interesting to me why that was added. Yes, I, I, saw, I, I saw his report. The report in the post-mortem, it doesn't really have any detail to work from yes. in terms of fixing the time of death. Yes, and uh, that's, that's the difficulty. And uh, past duo doesn't mean anything. Past could have been... Uh, same day as one of the witnesses yeah. testified. Dr. Naidu said that. Right? Yes. So Dr. Naidu gave expert evidence on yes. that specifically, my lord. So, yes, uh, my lord. But in the end, whether it happened uh, in the morning or in the afternoon, still the last people that was with Akhmetimo was Rodriguez. That's the last people, my lord. If I take his version. If I reject his version, in terms of the schedule of interrogation, when Timol died, he was in the hands of Groy and Van Nigel. I don't think there's a dispute on that one. And for some reason, they conveniently disappeared when at the time they fixed that uh, he fell out of the window. Now, he was in their care. At the very least, he was in their care. And uh, whether they were responsible to push him out, as Mr. Moodley said, in terms of the trajectory, or not, and as to who did that, we do not have that evidence. But the very least is that he was in custody, he was in their care. And I think they owed the court an explanation as to what measures did they take to ensure that no harm is brought to him. He was in their care, he was in the care of the police. And at the very least, uh, if a detainee is in care of the police, the police should be held responsible for what happens to that detainee. Just as basic as that. And I'm, I'm surprised that the magistrate didn't interrogate that. Quite, my lord. And it, it's in my head, just like you put it now, that the, they yes. were responsible for, for, for the well being of Akhmatim yes. and those people. So, yes, that's a narrow scope of what you've got to decide. And I quote, quote to you, my lord, specifically the section 16 of the Inquest Act, section 16 2 of the Inquest Act. Um, that you must find as to the identity, the cause or likely cause of death, the date of death, and as whether the death was brought about by any act. Um, now, obviously, in terms of subsection A, there can be no question, it's common cause. The original finding was Ahmed S. Optimo, Asiatis, a manlike person, 29 years old, geboren South Afrikaner, under wijze van beroep. My Lord, this court can just merely find that the identity of the deceased is Ahmed S. Optimo, the South African. As to the cause or likely cause of death, it was found originally, my lord, that the overheden is dood as gevolg van erge brain beskadiging en bloedverlies, opgedoemd waar hy by die venster uitgespring het van kamer 1026, the John Foster Plain, en geval het tot op die grond aan die suidekant van die gebouw, hy het selfmoord gepleeg. With respect, my lord, this finding, your finding must differ from this finding, and, and you must note in which respect you differ. Yes. Initially, Dr. Skippers gave the cause of death as multiple injuries, feel full of the serious. Under close questioning, he said the immediate cause of death was serious brain damage and loss of blood. My respectful submission to you would be, my lord, 
is that you follow Dr. Naidu's recommendation where in paragraph 41 of his affidavit he stated that the death was caused by massive head, in brackets brain and chest injury, vital center damage and compromised respiration. In his opinion, the loss of blood within and outside the body was not significant to any degree. Obviously, the finding regarding to suicide, you should reject that and scrap that, my lord. As to subparagraph C, the date, it's the 27th of October, my lord. We can debate as to the exact time, whether it was in the morning or in the afternoon. In the end, the police were responsible for it. And as to subparagraph D, as to whether the death was brought about by any act or omission prima facie involving or amounting to an offence on the part of any person, the respectful submission is yes. And I state here my head. He was in police custody and the police was responsible for his well-being, my lord. He died at the hands of the security police and their act or omission prima facie constitute murder, be it dollars eventualis or otherwise. Joao Rodriguez perpetuated the cover-up, for instance, that Timo looked shocked when he heard that Quentin Jacobson and two others were identified. There's no way that Joao Rodriguez, that this person, could not have seen the injuries, my lord. He did not want to play open cards with this court, and his act of omission prima facie amount to an offence on the part of Joao Rodriguez, be it accessory after the fact or as a co-conspirator, but amounting to an offence, my lord. Thus... The security police is responsible for Ahmed Timo's death, my lord. He was meant to be out at the cells at John Foster Plain. At least there would have been checks and balances. They chose, chose to hold him in the offices to cover up their assaults and torture, my lord. And with respect, this finding of you must be referred to the National Prosecuting Authority. I thank you, my lord. Thank you very much. Mr. Vanu, we have a few minutes before we adjourn. No, no, I'm, I'm prepared to, but it's just a few minutes left. Yes. You could perhaps give us the outline of your presentation. Yes. Uh, and, and my Lord, before I commence... Um, for, for the record, we have passed on certain uh, exhibits over the last few days. Yes. Uh, my Lord, they're already in your possession, so I'm not going to hand them up, but perhaps for the record, I can just take you through those particular exhibits. Yes. Um, my Lord, starting with uh, Exhibit C10A, that is a two-page supplementary trajectory report put together by Mr. T. Mudley. Uh, my Lord, it deals with uh, two scenarios. One, uh, the scenario raised in the book of Gordon Winter, Inside Boss. Um, there is uh, a passage in that book dealing with uh, Timol allegedly being held out the window by his ankles and then, and then dropped. Uh, so Mr. Mudley looks at that particular scenario. Um, and then Mr. Mudley also looks at certain of the um, allegations made by Mr. Rodriguez in his oral evidence in relation to the alleged dive. The Lord, the next exhibit is H21. Uh, that is the affidavit of Alwain Musson. Um, my Lord, in, the, in this affidavit, Mr. Musson contradicts the claims made by Seth Sons, who said that he never assaulted anybody. And in fact, my Lord, in all these affidavits that we have filed, um, there are allegations and assertions that they were abused and or assaulted and or tortured by Mr. Seth Sons. Uh, while in uh, police custody um, in John Foster Square, my lord. So the next one is H22, that's the affidavit of Mr. Hanif Vali. The next one is H23, that's the affidavit of Mr. Prem Naidu. Uh, there's H24, the affidavit of Mr. Ishmael Mamonyat. H25, the affidavit of Kevin Martin. And the last affidavit, H26, which is the affidavit of Rashid Vali Musa. My Lord, the final uh, exhibit is T, and that is the chronology uh, that we circulated yes. uh, on, on Monday.
So the last affidavits we referred to, all of them deal with the uh, evidence of Mr. Sons. That is correct. They contradict Sons about his ignorance of uh, assault. His, his ignorance of assault, um, the claim that he himself never assaulted anybody, yes. and the further claim that he was never present uh, during uh, assault or torture, all those claims are contradicted. That was his initial response, but when you questioned him, he suddenly lost memory that he couldn't remember. He didn't totally say, I didn't assault anybody. He said, I cannot remember. When you mentioned the names of the people whose evidence you are going to lead, that's, that's what my notes tell me. Yes, my, my recollection is that um, that is the case, that he certainly couldn't remember mm -hmm. names of individuals that we put to him. Although my recollection is, but we'll have to double check the record, is that he persisted with his denial of being present during an assault or, or him personally so assaulting anybody. Well, all three of them are saying they read about it in the papers, about okay. the assault of uh, detainees in the papers, Rodriguez, Els, as well as Sons. Th that is correct. Um, yeah. They only read it about it in, in the press, and they will have us believe that they did not even discuss it uh, amongst themselves. Mm. That's my recollection of, of the evidence you're watching. Yeah. Your Lordship, um, we have styled our heads as uh, short heads of argument. Yes. Um, we did uh, provide you with a skeletal outline, uh, and these short heads of approximately 40 pages add some meat and flesh uh, to the skeletal outline. Yes. Um, my Lord, we will be providing you with what we are styling as uh, main heads of argument. Uh, and I will uh, indicate to the court what's in those main heads. Uh, but to be clear, my Lord, we are not uh, presenting uh, those main heads today because there simply isn't time for that. My Lord, uh, the story of Ahmed Timur's brutal death at the hands of members of the notorious security branch didn't begin with an impromptu roadblock uh, in Field Street, Coronationville on the night of 22nd October 1971. It, its roots really can be traced to the apartheid system itself and its pathological obsession with race. Lord, that system didn't tolerate any serious dissent. In fact, it crushed those who stood up to it. And there were many who stood up to this pernicious system, and they did so notwithstanding considerable risk to themselves. And one of them was, was Ahmed Timal, he stood up to this formidable machinery, and to many at the time, that machinery must have come across as all-powerful and invincible. My Lord, the stormtroopers of the apartheid state was the hated security branch. This organization acted under the instruction and blessing of their political overlords at the time, and they targeted individuals like Timor, who questioned the legitimacy of the entire system, the security branch didn't hesitate to brutalize and, when necessary, to murder in an attempt to stem the tide of freedom. My Lord, some 21 detainees died in security detention before Timor died, and by the time of the demise of apartheid, that figure would climb to some 89 individuals. Eight of them perished in John Foster Square, 33 were led suicides and six involved falls from buildings or downstairs. Ahmed Timur would pay the ultimate price for standing up to apartheid. In so doing, he, he joined the illustrious ranks of Steve Biko, Griffiths and Victorian Khenge, Neil Agate, Babla Saluji, Fabian and Florence Ribeiro, and many others. And all these names will be forever rem remembered and cherished by South Africans, but the names of their tormentors will live on, but only in ignominy. The story is also a story of, of great injustice. It's a story of how dark forces were able to cover up crimes of torture and murder for some 46 years. It's the story of unbridled brutality meted out to young men and women held on the 10th floor of John Foster Square. It's the story of ugly collusion between police officers who were meant to uphold law and order 
but instead who covered up crimes of torture and murder. It's the story of a magistrate, Magistrate J.J. L. de Villiers, his assessor, Professor I. W. Simpson, and a senior public prosecutor, one P. A. J. Kotzer. Lord Mr. Kotzer appeared on a regular basis in political trials, and ten years later, after the Timor case, he was chosen as magistrate to preside over the Neil Agate inquest. <coughs> These individuals engaged in a charade of justice, happily playing their part in suppressing the truth and providing the imprimatur of legitimacy to the murderous conduct of the police. My Lord, Mr. Ishma, Mr. Imtiaz Kaji has spoken of the neglect, and I'm not going to take that, uh, that, that matter forward. He has placed that on record. Nonetheless, it is lamentable that action couldn't have been taken while key suspects like Gloy van Eekirk and General Bass uh, were still, al still alive. We would submit, though, that the reopening of this inquest provides the National Prosecuting Authority with an amazing opportunity to respond to the long-standing uh, long suffering of families of apartheid-era victims in their search for answers and justice. It's also the story of great inspiration and perseverance. The Timor family, my lord, in particular Timor's nephew and brother, Imtiaz Kaji and Mohammed Timor, they refused to let go of their quest for truth and justice. Their resolve and determination has been rewarded with this inquest before this particular court. For the first time, my lord, in 46 years, there has been a serious investigation of Mr. Timor's demise. Every possible aspect has been investigated uh, by this court. And my lord, this court has permitted the family the latitude to explore the full truth, and for that they are deeply grateful. Lord, the family extended an open hand to the surviving police witnesses. They went on record to say they're only interested in the truth. They sought no vengeance or retribution. If the truth was disclosed, they would not seek a prosecution on any particular charge. The Lord, re regrettably, this particular plea was spurned by the police witnesses. They doggedly stuck to the hymn sheets concocted by their masters decades ago. The police version, version largely adopted by the inquest court really asks us to suspend our belief in reality. They will have us believe that the security branch did not carry out torture. They will have us believe that they only heard about torture through claims made in the media. They will have us believe that Timor is treated with care and compassion by the security branch and unbelievably just like one of their own children. My Lord, that, that claim was made by none other than Colonel Piet Greiling, who was the officer commanding of the security branch in John Foster Square at the time of the uh, Timor incident. And it emerged in the ESOP case, the interdict to have, the, um, have a restraining order finalized against the police. They will have us believe that Timor's interrogators were honest and fair men. They will have us believe that Timor would have preferred death to a long prison sentence. They will have us believe that they did what they could for the critically injured Timor. They will have us believe that the police carried out a rigorous and methodical investigation in reaching the conclusion that nobody was to blame. My Lord, none of it is believable. None of it bears any relationship with the truth. In the circumstances, the Timor family seeks justice against the police witnesses who continue to perpetrate the cover-up of the crimes committed against Timor. We take an adjournment at this stage. As the court pleases.